Hi, and welcome to Programming Like It's 1979 from NAND to Tetris. Today is our first lab. We are going to be doing not gates. What I'm going to do here is actually work through each exercise with you. I'm going to do it first visually using Helmut Niemann's digital, and then I'm going to actually write the HDL in question. So first of all, for any given gate, we want to look at our specification. Our specification is right here in the comment that says it's a NOT gate. And the only specification we have is that the out value equals NOT in. The starting point for almost any chip design is going to be the interface, which means the pins that are leading into the chip and the pins that are leading out from the chip. So here we could see we just have two input, one input and one output, and that's it. So we don't actually need to uh, graph this, but we're going to. Let's flip over to digital. And I believe we needed one input, which we will name just to be rigorous about it. We'll name it in. And we need one output, which we will also name as out. Okay. So we need, we know we need a NAND chip. That's the name of the course is NAND Tetris. So as we think about a NOT gate, NOT says that if the input is zero, the output is going to be one. If the input is one, the output is going to be zero. How could we do that with just a NAND gate? Well, the truth table for a NAND gate is that it's always true unless both inputs are true. So since we know that the only time we want our NOT circuit to be false or zero is when the input is true, that suggests that we should be able to wire up this input to both of our NAND inputs. So let's do that. Excuse me if I talk slowly while I do this. I want to be precise. There we go. And we'll wire up the output of the NAND gate to the output of our circuit. Let's try and simulate it, see if I got everything connected correctly. It looks like I did. Right now our input is off and our output is on. That's what the slightly brighter green means. Uh, if I toggle our input on, the output toggles off. So that looks correct to me. So now we're gonna write some HDL. You can see we have a comment that says, put your code here, very helpful. If the, you read the book, there is a chapter that goes through the entire HDL syntax, but by and large, what you're going to be doing is defining a part and defining what inputs and outputs are wired up to that part. Let's take a look. We're going to, we know that we only have one part here, it's one NAND, so we're going to put a NAND in place. And because I'm using Visual Studio Code with a certain add-on, it suggests some autocomplete for me, and that's going to be helpful because it's going to suggest the syntax for me. Let's accept that. You can see we have two inputs labeled A and B and an output in this NAND. So for input A, we're going to connect that to the in port on this chip. For input B, we're going to connect that to the input port on this chip. And for output, we're going to connect that to the output port of the NOT chip. These are the same thing. One thing I do want to point out here is that this naming here, this out equals out, it's going to get a little confusing as your chips get more and more complicated and you start nesting more of these. It's not going to be uncommon to find yourself needing to take an extra moment to think, what context is this word out appearing in? So don't be surprised if that happens. Let's save this and let's go to our hardware simulator. We're going to load this chip, which is over here, not.hdl. Load chip. Check to make sure our code is actually there. There it is. And now we're going to load the test script, which is going to have the same name as not.hdl, except ending in TST. And then we can click this button to run our test. Very simple test here. Our test passed. That's the not chip. All right, let's do our OR gate next. 
Our output is 1 if either a is 1 or b is 1. We have the same inputs as we had earlier, a, b, and the same output. So schematically, the OR gate looks very much like our other gates. So let's see what happens if we just pop a NAND gate in there. I'm sure that that is not the correct answer, but let's take a look. We'll simulate it. If both of these are off, our output is on. Well, this is already very wrong. If one of these is on, our output is on. If the other is on, our output is on. If both of them are on, the output is off. That's a NAND gate. The interesting thing here is that's almost, almost right. It's, it's inverted. If we think about our truth table for OR, uh, NAND gate would be 0, 0, 0, 1, or excuse me, 1, 1, 1, 0. And this is like the matrix has been flipped. So what can we do combinatorically? Well, if we think of the interesting thing here is this off state, right? If both of those are off, then this is on. What we should be able to do here, let me stop our simulation. Let's go ahead and stick couple of NOT gates in here. Let's invert the signals coming out of our inputs. Now, if either of these, if both of these are false, then our NOT gates will make both of them true. And when both things are true, a NAND gate will emit false. And in every other case, if there's any situation other than one of them is true. Okay, so both of these are off and that's off. That's correct. One of them is on, that's on. That one's on, that's on. And if they're both on, that is also on. Great, we've solved it. So two NOT gates connected to the inputs and a NAND gate connected to the outputs of the NOT gates. So now we have three parts coming in here. We have one NOT gate. I like to put all the parts down before I start declaring the wires. We have a second NOT gate and we have a NAND gate. This can be connected to input A. This can be connected to input B. Now we need to declare a wire. In this HDL language, simply using a name will implicitly create a wire if you're using it in the right context like here. So here I will call this not a out. It's a little confusing to call it not the a out, but I think we know what we mean. We'll call this not b out. And then our input to the NAND gates are going to be these two wires, not a out and not b out. And then our output of this NAND gate is wired to the output of the chip. All right, let's see if we got it right. Load our script and run our tests. Let's see. Excellent, that's an OR gate. Let's go on to AND. So for AND this time, we have two inputs and one output. We have an input A, an input B, and an output out. So let's think about how we might do this. We'll flip over to Logisim. Oh, and let's go ahead and save this circuit. All right, we're going to create a couple of inputs labeled and one output. So let's think about this again. Well, let's start with the NAND simply on instinct because we know that we don't have very many gates yet. 
The truth table for and is it's always false unless both things are true. The truth table for NAND is it's always true unless both inputs are false. So there's a pretty obvious answer here, which is that we can negate the output of our NAND gate. And that should get us the correct answer. Let's see if I left enough space here for an inverter. I did. I need to connect that there, connect that there. goes there, and that goes there. Try and simulate it. Both inputs are off and our output is off. As we turn on each input, the output stays off. When we turn on both inputs, the output goes on. That is an AND gate. So we have two parts now. We have a NAND and we have our NOT gate. Oops, let's try that again. All right, so one thing I like to do is I, I almost like to work from the outside in sometimes. So we know that the NOT gate is the last thing in the chain and it's connected to our output of the AND chip. And we know that our inputs A and B are connected to the A and B inputs on the chip. And again, here you see we've got that A equals A, B equals B, very easy to get confused. So the only thing really special here in the HDL is taking our two parts that we've defined and wiring them together. So in this case, what we need to do is we need to define a wire. Different HDL languages have different ways of doing this. I believe in this language, I can simply make up a symbolic name, and as long as it matches, it will implicitly create the wire. So let's go ahead and we'll say, we'll call this is not in. Maybe not the best name, but let's try it anyway. You know, actually, uh, I don't know if this is, if ordering is important since we're defining the NAND first. So let me reverse that. We'll say that our, the out of our NAND is connected to a wire called NAND out, and the input of our NOT is also connected to NAND out. We'll save it. Let's see if that's going to work. We load our chip. We load our test, and we run our test. Great, and that worked. That's the end chip. Next up is XOR, or exclusive OR. Well, this one, they're almost giving us the answer in the problem definition here. Our output equals not A equals B. XOR gate, or exclusive OR, not A equals B. That's kind of interesting, an interesting way to phrase that. So bringing up the truth table, if one of these is true, but not both, then our output is true. If both outputs are false, then the XOR's output is false. If both our outputs are true, the XOR's output is true. Yeah, a trivial way to do this would be to say not the OR of A and B and of not A and not B. Okay, that, I managed to confuse myself even just saying that out loud. Let me think about that. Oh, I'm reasonably sure that that actually is correct, even though I just confused myself saying it. We are going to need a little more room here. We've, cre we've already created our AND gate. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we have A... and B, I'm going to have a mess of wires here by the time we're done.
And then we're going to use our OR gate that we just defined. Go ahead and bring that over here. Go ahead and bring that over here. So now we have A and B. And we have A or B. So the case where neither of these is high is kind of a not or situation. Right? So if either of these situations are true, In that case, we do not want, oh, and I put it in the wrong place. Oh, well, let's see if this is correct. Did I get everything connected up wire? Okay, A and B are off, our output is off. If A is on, our output is on because this not gate is saving us. If B is on, our output is on. And if both of these are on, they're both off. Great, we got it. I have a sense that this may not be the optimal solution. This feels too complicated to me for XOR, but it's easy to understand. And I'm a big believer in make it work first and make it efficient later. Um, there are electrical engineering techniques you could use to essentially look at the map, to look at the truth table, and from the size of the truth table, derive what the minimum number of parts you're going to need to do it are. Um, it's a technique called a Carnot map. Carnot map, But we're not going to do that right now. I'm just going to roll with this because we have a lot of circuits to get through. An AND, two ORs, and two NOTs connected from left to right. AND, OR, NOT, OR, NOT, output. All right. What did I say? I said an AND. No. And an or. Don't know why I'm not getting the autocomplete there. A not. Another or. And another not. I might have said before, I like to work from the outside in, so we know that this is our outermost not, and it's going to be connected to the out. We know that both our AND and our OR are going to be connected to our inputs. And that just leaves us with our internal wires. So we'll say this is AND out. We'll call this OR1 out. This NOT gets the output of our OR gate becomes not one out. This OR gets, on one hand, it gets it from AND, and on the other hand, it gets it from not one out. This is our second OR, so we'll call it OR2 out. And this input is OR2 out. Oh. All right, let's see if we got it right. XOR, huh? Load chip. XOR, load script, XOR, I've got my fingers crossed. Phew, that's XOR. Now we get to what I consider to be the first interesting chip, which is our multiplexer or MUX. Let's take a look at what the definition is. Out equals A if selector is zero or B otherwise. All right, we have a more inputs and outputs than we've ever had before. We have three inputs and one output. All right, we need a new input here. Let's go ahead and grab it. I'm gonna put it even further down on purpose to separate it because it's special. In fact, can I adjust rotation? I love it. Let's rotate it. Yes, yes, look at that. 
That is awesome. So we can actually have our selector kind of coming in from the bottom of the chip here. That's how it should be. That's how it's intended. All right, so essentially we want to pass one of these two inputs, A or B, in unchanged, depending on the state of this selector. So we're going to pass in, pass out A to the output if the selector is also high, if it's also one. So when you say the word also to yourself, you should be thinking and. And if you think, when do we send the B over? We're going to send B over when the selector is not one. So again, the selector is related to this. Its state is related to this. But it's the inverse state. So the two things I'm thinking in this situation are not an and. So I'm just going to throw a few different things down here. Okay. We're going to put an and gate here. I'm going to put another and gate here. And I want a not gate just for the selector optionally. Not sure I like where I've put these things. At some point, I need to figure out how to actually move these once I've placed them. Oh, look at that. I see. I shouldn't be dragging. It's just click and move. All right. That makes sense. Give ourselves a little more room here. All right. So right. I'm going to declare that the selector is always going to, or a wire emanating from the selector is always going to be the second input to these gates. You don't have to declare that, but I'm going to. So that one's going there. All right. It sucks. Why can't I do this? It's got to be away from. Oh, I see. I can just. I see. If I click and then I can continue and essentially click twice. Okay. And so our A in this situation is going to go here. So this is A and selector, stronger together. And this is B and not selector, also stronger together. So if either one of the, we want to pass on either one of these. We know because of the logic is simple enough here that only one of these AND gates is ever going to be true. So we want to pass one or the other. We just said the magic word, which is OR. Put that there. And we'll connect that there. And we'll connect this here. Uh, there's never any good way to keep the wiring neat. Uh, I'm being very catch as catch can right now. By the time we get up to the ALU or the CPU, it's going to be really important to keep these wires neat if you want to draw them. Uh, you don't have to draw them for this class, and I, I kind of recommend you don't, but it definitely triggers my kind of neat nick nature, and I'll end up spending you know, 15, 20 minutes routing the wires around so they look as neat as possible. I have a suspicion that that is not going to make for compelling video, so I will probably just make that happen through the magic of editing rather than watch you watch me move wires around. All right, so one, two, three, four parts in addition to our inputs. One NOT gate, two AND gates, and an OR gate connecting the AND gates. So our NOT gate, I'm going to put our NOT gate first, because our NOT gate, I think of this NOT gate here as being a virtual input. It's not, really, but, but we're almost treating it like it. I'm going to give it this special name, NOT selector. All right, we have an AND gate. Our AND gate is A equals A. No objective is allowed. And one out. We have a second AND gate. A equals B. Much better. That's really going to upset some people that I typed A equals B. That's going to take our NOT selector output. And this will be AND2 out. 
And lastly, or, which is going to take the output from each of our AND gates. And connect up to the output. Let's see if it works. Load our mux. Load our mux test. And run our test. You can adjust, by the way, the speed of the test using this slider. Comparison failure at line four. So we now have, it's actually, determining what these lines mean is actually tricky, but it looks like the case where A is zero, B is one, and the selector is off, is managed to fail. So let's actually simulate this. See what we did wrong. We said A is off, B is on, and selector is zero. Right, that sure is wrong. We are, selector is off, and we are taking the output from B. And if I turn selector on, we're taking A. If they're both on, we still have the right answer. It literally looks like I am taking the wrong input. Oh, I absolutely did get this completely 100% wrong. So if we think about this, we want A only when the selector is not set. That's the situation where we want this. So I literally did get this 100% inverted. So fortunately, that's easy enough to fix. Our gates were right, our wires were wrong. That goes there. That goes there. Let's simulate this again. Selector is off, so we should be getting A. Selector is on, so we should be getting B. And that's correct. It figures that the one time I did not actually test this in the drawing program was the time I got it wrong. I've created this circuit tens of times, and I still managed to get it wrong, so go me. This gets not selector, and this gets selector. Let's try it again. Reload the chip here. And now we have to, because we reloaded a new chip, we also have to load the test again. That's all the way up. Go as fast as possible. Here we go. All right, this time we got it right. That's a MUX. DMUX. This is exciting because it is our first chip that's going to have two outputs. Uh, it has two inputs, one input and one selector, and two outputs, A and B. So let's take a look. We're going to start with fresh inputs and outputs. That one is our input. That one is our selector. And because I'm going to be fancy, I'm going to rotate it. And then we need two outputs. Call this one output A. We'll call this one output B. Well, we want to do a similar thing that we did last time with the MUX in we need this selector both in its native state, but we also need it in its inverted state. And hopefully this time I won't, uh, I won't get them mixed up. So again, I think we're going to need a couple of ands here. So if the selector is true, then we want to pass input Right, if the selector is true, then our input goes to B. I'm pretty sure that was correct this time. And if our input is false, no, if our selector is false, which 
groups here. Then we pass this in, in the input. There we go. All right, so our input is off. Both A and B are off, that's correct. Our input is on and the selector is off. We're going to A. Our input is on and the selector is on. We're going to B. That's correct. All right, I think this is correct. We have three gates, a NOT gate, and two AND gates. Simpler than the multiplexer, actually. All right, we're going to say NOT. Again, we're going to make our special, what I end up thinking of in my addled brain as a virtual input. We have an AND gate, which is going to take NOT selected. And we get to say B equals A, upsetting all the Ayn Rand fans out there. And that connects to A. No, B equals input. Oh, well. And we get to say if A is selected, is wired up to selected, B is always going to be wired to our input. And our output is B. This one. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. We'll find out soon enough if we've got it wrong. We're going to load the DMUX, and we're going to load the script. Big bucks, no whammies. Great. That's a DMUX. Moving on, we're going to do the first of our multi-bit gates. Let's look at NOT16. So one thing that I want to call out here is we're introducing a little more syntax into our HDL. We can see it's a 16-bit NOT for I equals 0 to 15, out sub I equals NOT in sub I. And if we look at our definition of our inputs and outputs, our interface definition, we can see that there's this array syntax here. This means that this in port has 16 bits in it, and this out port has 16 bits in it. So how are we going to do this? Right off the bat, let me tell you, I, I don't want to draw 16 of these because it's going to be kind of ponderous to do so. So instead, let's do this as a 2-bit NOT gate. And if we can draw it as a 2-bit NOT gate, then we can generalize to 16 and actually do the 16 in the HDL. So we're going to add an input and an output. Label them, and you can see here it says data bits. Well, let's make it two data bits. Similarly, we're going to label our output and make that two data bits. So now, as our wire comes off here, this wire is actually carrying two bits. If I take a normal NOT gate and just try and connect it, I expect the graphing program to complain about that. doesn't complain. Oh, no. There we go. When I actually simulate the circuit, it's complaining there are two bits needed, but only one bit found. I'm actually surprised it even let me connect this without freaking out. Logisim will actually complain when there's a width difference. So what we need here is another component called a splitter. And we'll put that right there. I need to okay. So I've now configured that splitter such that it is going to take two bits, conveniently marked zero and one. We're going to put another NOT gate right down here. Connect bit one to that NOT gate. And then we want another splitter. Splitter, this is a merger, I guess. And we'll configure it. We're going to take two one-bit values and output one two-bit value. That goes there, that goes there. I gave myself a lot of room here, but I didn't need it. 
Okay, so this looks correct to me. We could certainly draw this 16 times. I ain't gonna. Let's go do this in HDL. So we'll do the first bit first. What's our input? Well, here we need a little array syntax. Um, we're going to dereference this in wire, this multi-bit in wire. We're going to dereference it just as if it were a C array, which means a square bracket and the number of the sub wire that we want in this case, zero. We're going to do the same thing with our output. And congratulations, at this point, we get to copy paste 15 more times. There's no good way to do this in any editor <laughs> that I know of. So I'm going to use the magic of editing to fill this out. And we're back. We have 16 NOT gates, each wired to one wire. Let's see if it works. Load our chip. We take our NOT 16 chip. There is everything. Load our script. I should say, if you have an egregious syntax error in your script, the hardware simulator will complain on load, which is nice. Let's run it. That's our 16-bit NOT gate. For our 16-bit AND gate, this is going to be very similar conceptually to our 16-bit OR gate, or excuse me, our 16-bit NOT gate. So let's diagram a 2-bit AND gate. We need a second input. We'll call it 2 bits, label it B. We need a splitter merger that is going to go from 2 to 1, 1. We need several of these. We need a couple of AND gates. We'll call this one 0. Call this one 1. And that's totally wrong. Ooh. And then we need another splitter merger. And that's our 2-bit AND gate. So let's go ahead and do this in HDL. We know we need an AND gate. We need to refer to our array syntax, the zeroth wire of A, the zeroth wire of B, all wired up to the zeroth wire of out. And this concept here, these arrays, are what is known as a bus. So you'll hear that referred to again and again as we move forward. Uh, once again, I don't want to make you sit here while I type this and edit it 16 times. So through the magic of editing, there's our 16-bit AND gate. I'm feeling pretty confident about this one. Let's try it out. Run our tests. And we're good to go. That's our 16-bit AND gate. <clears throat> 16-bit OR gate. I'm not even going to diagram this or use the magic of editing to do it. I'm literally going to copy-paste the AND gate. And then I'm going to search and replace AND. Let's test it. Da, 
That's our OR gate. Now our 16-bit MUX. This one is actually a little bit different. Not a lot different. We can, as before, use our 16 AND lines as the basis of this. Let's go ahead and get rid of AND and change it to MUX. However, however, we also have slightly more a slightly more complicated interface because we have this selector bit. The selector bit in our 16-bit MUX is not a 16-bit value. It continues to be a 1-bit value. So we're just going to, again, literally search and replace. Let's test it. That's a 16-bit MUX. Eight-way OR, OR, OR eight-way. So if we look at the interface for this, we see that it has an 8-bit input. So right off the bat, you might be thinking, what's the difference between this and our 16-bit OR? If we look at the output, however, we can see that there's only one bit of output. So you could think of this as a reduction. We're taking all those eight bits together. We're going to put them into a, an OR gate with eight inputs effectively and collapse those down into a single answer. If any one of these input wires is one, then our output will be one. If all of these input wires are zero, then our output will be zero. Let's go ahead and put down one eight bit input and one one bit output. Here's our input. We're going to say it's 8 bits with the label in. And our output, we will label out and leave it at 1 bit. And right off the bat, we know this is 8 bits. We're not going to be able to, we don't have anything right now that takes 8 bits as input. So right off the bat, we know we're going to have to split that wire. I'm going to go and drop a splitter here. Okay. So there's actually at least two ways to make this. There's probably more. One thing we could do is we can drop multiple OR gates, like so. We could wire 0 and 1 up to this one, 2 and 3 up to this one, 4 and 5 up to some notional one here, and 6 and 7 up to some notional one here. That would leave us with four OR gates, plus two more to collapse these two, plus one more, that would be four, five, six, seven gates total. The other thing we could do is we could arrange these like so, where zero and one wire up to here, the output of this and two wire up to here, the output of this and three, that would be a third gate, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. So however one does this would be uh, you would use seven gates. Is one of those ways better of better a better way of doing it than any other? I think so. I started this combinatoric circuit section by telling you that we don't have to worry about propagation delay, that we can treat these circuits as if they resolve instantly. But that isn't strictly true. I think I, I did, in fact, say that. And if we waterfall these OR gates seven deep, then we're actually, that means that to get the answer here at our out gate, we are going to have to go through all seven gates. The delay from the, essentially from this wire here would have to cascade through all of these. Whereas if we arrange them like so, then I think our maximum gate delay is going to be um, three.
three levels of OR gates. At least I think that's true. In practice, does it matter? I mean, I don't know. God, oh God, I haven't left enough room. Start our simulation. This is off. Our output is off. If any of these wires is on, we expect our output is on. In fact, we can trace the path. All right, let's actually build our code. We know we're going to have seven of these. All of them are connected to the same input, but different wires in that input. So those four are connected to the actual input wires, and then these ORs are all connected to our other ORs. That's our second tier. And that's our final OR. Let's see if it worked. That's an eight-way OR gate. Let's take a look at the four-way DMUX. So looking at our interface, we have a one-bit input, and we have a two-bit selector. And then we have four outputs, A, B, C, and D. Looking at the description here, you can see that the in bit is going to be routed to one of these four outputs depending on the number essentially contained within the selector. So the four-way and eight-way muxes and demuxes are not actually difficult, but they are complicated. Uh, it's very easy to lose yourself or lose track of what you're doing in the middle of it. So let's let's actually take a look at what this might look like. So here are the inputs and outputs for our DMUX. I've already gone ahead and put down a two-bit selector and a splitter because I suspect I'm going to need both of those wires. We could try to build this from primitive gates, but we already have this DMUX, right? And the DMUX kind of does the right thing, right? So let's see what happens if we declare that instead of having our AND gates and our NOT gates and what have you, let's declare that this DMUX is connected to this input. No, that's going to be wrong. We'll leave its input empty for now. But we are going to connect it to the least significant bit of the selector. And then this is our output for A. This is our output for B. And then we're going to have a second DMUX. It's going to be connected much the same. That goes to A, excuse me, to C, and this goes to D. So then that only leaves the question, what are these DMUXs connected to? If we connect them both straight to the input, then 
we would be vectoring this input to two outputs, which is not the definition. Well, what we can do here, I believe, is we can put another demultiplexer here. Only this time, we're going to use the most significant bit. And then this becomes the input to the other demuxes. Let's see if that worked. Did I get everything wired? I did not. Oh, I failed to change that to two bits. Nothing collected to selector input. Helps if you actually connect up all the wires. All right. So selector is zero. Input is one. We'll turn the input on. OK, when it is zero, we're going to input A. When it is one, zero, one, we're going to input C. That seems wrong to me. Oh, I understand what's happening. So I actually have the significance order completely backwards here. Um, one is actually the most significant. I was trying to read this from left to right as if it were a number, but really zero is the least significant bit and one is the most significant bit. So let me quickly rewire this. Actually, I kind of cheated and just flipped the splitter so that it was the orientation that I expected. All right, we'll try this again. With zero, it goes to A. With one, it goes to B. With a binary two, it goes to C. And with a binary three, it goes to D. Fabulous. I think this works. So, chips. Three demuxes, that's it, with the one bit, the high bit in the selector wired up to our first demux, the low bit in the selector wired up to our second demuxes. Let's see if we can do this. All right, so, demux, we need three of them, right? Let's go ahead and just put those all down now. Top DEMA, the first DMUX is getting wired up to our N. These get our outputs working from the outside in, as I like to do. This gets the first bit of the selector, not self. This is not C. And this gets hmm, what are we going to call this? Call it out DA and out DB. All right. Oh. As always, it's a typo. Try it again. Okay. Run our tests. Fingers crossed. That is our four-way DMUX. Let's take a look at the eight-way DMUX. So this is the four-way DMUX, only even more so. I'm not going to draw this one. I think we're just going to jump in and do this one just by HDL. If you look at the diagram, the schematic for the four-way DMUX, this is going to be that only extended even further. And I don't feel like drawing the rat's nest of wires that's going to be necessary to do an eight-way DMUX. I'm not positive, but my instinct here is we could either build a nest of demuxes or we could possibly do this with just three larger chips. If we were to use 
two four-way DMUXs and then one kind of top-level two-way DMUX to choose between them, to select between them, I think that would work. Let's give it a go. Not entirely sure this will work, but no guts, no glory. All right. You might notice that when I do the autocomplete here, we actually do have the definitions for the more complicated chips. So yes, you could in fact just put the DMUX 8-way chip in here and it would use the system implementation of that. That's cheating, don't do that. All right, so first let's work from the outside in. Let's do our outputs first. Our first DMUX can go between A, B, C, and D. And then our second four-way DMUX can go to E, F, G, and H. The input to our top-level DMUX is going to be the input bit as before. And we're going to take the most significant bit of the selector, which is a three-bit selector. So that should be two, because someone in 1960 decided that these things should be zero indexed, and they were wrong. Then we need to define some top level output. So let's call this out DA. You know what? Let's not call it that. Let's give it, let's call it ABCD because that's what we think. That's where we think it's going, right? Let's call this EFGH. And this gets ABCD, this gets EFGH. This gets what? I might have to go look up the array syntax to get a partial array. I don't think we can do this. I'm going to refer to the book. I'll be right back. I'm back, and I think we actually can use this syntax. I looked in Appendix A of the book, Appendix A, Section 5.3 on buses. I believe we can try and do this. We'll find out. If it doesn't work, there's surely another way to do it. All right, let's go back to our hardware simulator. We'll go to DMUX 8-way. Of course, I had another typo. I'm going to keep doing that, aren't I, for this entire section of the class. There we go. That's looking positive. Run our tests. We have made an eight-way DMUX. Four-way 16-bit multiplexer. Let's take a look. Our input, inputs, excuse me, are going to be 16-bit inputs this time. So we know right off the bat, we'll probably be using the MUX16 chip that we made earlier. Our selector bit is two bits instead of one. And if you looked at our four-way DMUX exercise, the logic here is going to be very similar. In fact, let's call up that code. I'm not going to bother to draw this one out because Whenever you have 16 bits at a time, working with the splitters is annoying. This one I'm just going to do in HDL. Let's take a look. We solved our four-way DMUX with just three DMUXs. And my intuition is that we're going to be able to do something very similar here with our 16-bit MUXs. And I'm going to take three of them here. So unlike a DMUX, the muxes are taking inputs and sending them to one output. So logically, our last mux is going to be connected to our output, and it's going to be using, it's going to have to choose which of these two muxes it's listening to, which is going to be the most significant bit. The most significant bit of the selector is one. And it's going to be connected to these two muxes. Well, let's do the inputs first. Let's work from the, the outside in, as I am wont to do. 
we have four inputs. A equals C, B equals D, objectivists everywhere. Get very upset. We're going to use our least significant bit here. And then we're going to, let's call it mux A out and mux B out. Actually, A and B are wrong, are bad terms to use. Call them mux1 and mux2. Mux2 out. All right. It looks pretty simple. I've probably made a mistake. Let's find out. It loaded cleanly. That's always a good sign. And that's our four-way 16-bit MUX. The final exercise for this chapter of the book is to implement an eight-way 16-bit MUX. We already implemented an eight-way DMUX. So since our intuition for the four-way MUX actually worked really well, let's take a look at the eight-way DMUX solution. And here what we've got is three DMUXs but again, since this is a mux rather than a demux, we're kind of flipping it so that the higher bit selection happens at the last possible moment. So we're going to try this using two four-way 16-bit muxes and one 16-bit mux, right? So let's say mux four-way 16. I think I said two of them, right? And lastly, one 16-bit mux. Working from the outside in, we're going to connect our mux to the out. And this is going to be using, as in our four-way example, we're just generalizing this or extending the logic. This is going to use the most significant bit, which is two. Likewise, these are going to use the least significant bits, 0 and 1. I need names for this. Mux 1 out. And mux 2 out. And then that. And then E, F, G, and H. H. This comes here. Mux 1 out is wired up to A. Mux 2 out is wired up to B. It can be interesting to draw out these circuits so you could actually satisfy yourself uh, that the flow works. It's really a thankless task, and I think doing it for the basic two way circuits makes a lot of sense. And the more you start building larger and larger structures, maybe the, the less sense it makes. Because this is so mechanical that you don't really get a lot of visual intuition from a bunch of lines going everywhere. All right, let's see if we did this right. Mux 8-way 16. I'm very excited. Here we go. That is our eight-way 16-bit MUX. That is all of the basic logical connectives we're going to be making for this class. Next week, in next week's lecture, we're going to start talking about arithmetic and binary arithmetic, uh, which will be also combinatoric circuits, as these are, but of a different character. So I hope you found these labs useful. If I am not explaining enough in them if I'm explaining too much. I hope you'll give me that feedback in the comments. Thanks for coming along on this adventure. This has been Programming Like It's 1979. Thanks for watching. <laughs>